Um, you would notice on the course outliner that we don't have a workshop tomorrow, and we don't have a workshop tomorrow. So enjoy the uh, long weekend from this course at least. Um, the other little thing that I maybe want to emphasize is that I know some students find that this lecture style is a bit different. I try to be engaging, but you're struggling to just ascertain what is the emphasis. Let's hopefully use this little diagram to give you the emphasis is what's written on the board. Because if you don't come to lectures, you can't see the board. <laughs> it's informed by what is on the slides. And you need to be informed by what is on the readings. The slides are, a, I, I would say, um, sort of a minimum to know. Um, the more blank ones and the more board work, perhaps the more to know. Um, but you're not going to be caught off guard. I am realistic, but by the time we're going to have a test on this subject, it's going to be uh, quite far away away necessarily from my lectures. So um, I don't think you need to be frightened by the sort of questions that I'm going to be setting for your tests and for your exams. Um, also, there's the added advantage that what we're going to be increasingly doing from today until the end of this lecture series is very more modern to what we are used to. You know, it's, it's not theory. We're not going to be discussing stuff that you'd be perhaps seeing for the first time, like Marx's superstructures, etc. Uh, we're going to be moving through economic doctrine, which you're already familiar with, from a history of economic perspective, and again chasing down this fish that's run throughout these five lectures about the Cambridge Capital debate and the Vixel problem, which we'll get to touch on with quite a lot of fun today. Today's lecture, however, is titled The Great Consolidation. And we're going to be looking at only two economists today, Marshall and Vixel. We're not going to look at Pigot as part of this uh, five lecture series. Yesterday, we introduced Marshall the person. Today, we're going to look at Marshall the economist. Now, I wanted to make sure I get everything that I need to tell you. I have my lecture notes here as well. All right. So after the tripos, where we ended yesterday, Marshall joined the discussion club. And as would probably be expected, expected it was with dissenters. This discussion club uh, included people like uh, Maurice, who was a Christian scholarist, uh, Clifford, who was another physicist, and Sedgwick, who you might have heard about from his contributions to philosophy. But what was happening here? Marshall was driven to economics as a consolidator. And that is an important fact, because he and Bixel share this common desire to want to align up the works of Hume, Smith, Ricardo, and Mill, our classical economists, with the later works of Jevons and uh, our marginalist economists. And we're going to see the two alignings and some of the differences that come out that, that are dispelled today. A nice comparison, wouldn't you agree? In the beginning of Marshall's career as an economist, around 1886, he was, in his own words, setting mill to geometry. This does not sound particularly interesting. And in fact, it isn't. It's also rather tricky, trying to set Mill's principles <coughs> into a geometric space. But Marshall was a different sort of economist to today, and I think that's another emphasis we want to look at, that today there is a mantra or a doctrine in economic thought that you publish or perish. Marshall, if I apply to this doctrine, would be as dead as a doornail, and most certainly not spending two lectures on. His entire out no, two, yeah, half a lecture on. His entire output consists of only four books, and this includes his collected papers. We'll move through and see how he got there. But Marshall was a man of very slow moving, considerate thought. He says that in his own words, 
I was driven from metaphysics and went to ethics and thought that the justification for the condition of society was not easy. A friend who I had read a great deal of what is now called moral sciences, the classicals, constantly said, ah, if you understand political economy, you would not say this and that. So I read Mill's political economy and got much excited about it. I had the doubt about the properties of inequalities, of opportunities rather than material comfort. And then in my vacations, I visited the poorest quarters of several cities and walked through one street looking at the faces of the poorest people. Next resolve to ache, as I thought I could study political economy. Mill's approach to political economy in 1875 sums up also his way of approaching it. From what you've just heard and what, from what we're going to look at, you'll see that Mill was actually involved in what would be early field work. led him to do things like the following. On one of my most vivid recollections of a visit I made in 1875 to study American protectionism, on the spot is that of Mr. Carey's splendid anger as he explained that foreign commerce had even made the railroads of America run from east to west rather than north to south. What an odd observation. You know, we're getting an idea of Marx of Marshall as through his own experience of field work. And this was what he experienced when he traveled to the United States. In 1877, he resigns his chair in Cambridge. His original chair in Cambridge was actually that of um, political philosophy. And in fact, he started with the chair of physics. He goes to Bristol, where he starts writing up some of his early thoughts. And these are things that we now take for granted. We'll see in the next slide. But he returns as professor of the political economy to Cambridge in 1885. And the first contribution that we see published is his discussion on psi-metallism, which deserves a bit of a due. The problem with bullion at that time in England was that there was a mixture between gold and silver standards. Now, the value of gold and silver by the species flow critique, you, you're familiar with that? Okay, you're going to meet the species flow critique uh, with Bradley. But it essentially has to, uh, the critique goes a little bit like this. If the value of a coin, which is made out of silver or gold, <coughs> has its material value, in essence the gold or the silver in the coin, is now worth more than um, the actual printed value. So if the coin is a one pound coin, but its gold value is one and a half pounds, we get flow of specie. And specie is a word for currency. And the actual currency of the country is moved from that country to another country where they're buying it at arbitrage. Arbitrages? To buy something to make a profit. Why are we laughing? Now, Marshall had a very interesting answer to this. He advocated for psi-metallism. And psi-metallism is a binding of gold to silver. How does this differ from bimetallism? Bimetallism is the actual infusion of the gold and silver to create, say, a new coin. Or a coin in which, um, or reserves in which 
we have um, a, a mixture of the two amalgams. Psi-metallism, on the other hand, is to use the two bound together in a way that they could be separable, but not really that easily. And this protects against things where we would have species flow, for instance, on the gold side, but not on the silver side. So it creates a, a, a protection device. And at the time, this not had yet been suggested. The only suggestion which it was countering was Ricardo's on psi-metallism. Marshall then um, finally finalizes his views on protection. So he says that protection would be the protection that we've seen, the infant, argu infant industry argument industry argument that we spoke that you've written a test on, and we've spoken about, would not be a suitable argument to be made for British rule. And he was the first one to really advocate against this uh, idea of what List was. Are you familiar with List? List was wanting for America. For some economists, this is their entire life's work. A few footnotes in what would be considered it. Uh, progression. But for Marshall, we are yet to get to the crux of the matter. In 1890, he makes his first publication. He'd been working as a professional economist for already 30 years, and he publishes the principles. What made the principles so interesting? The principles is an early textbook designed at students who assume very little economic knowledge and who work through um, solving problems. The Principles is the book to look to when you are looking for assumptions relating to any of the contributions that Marshall made. And they are numerous, aren't they? He brought through the idea of supply and demand curves, Elasticities, distinction between stocks and flows, internal and external economies. What does this mean? It's like closed systems. Uh, and you, you've done the uh, TF output and input tables. So it's um, uh, a closed economy versus an open economy. Fairly similar idea. He was the first to start writing on it in a, in a formalized background. Um, the functional distinction between short and long run periods. How interesting is that? Previous to this, there had been no economy that had balanced the two. Consumer surpluses, producer surpluses, the Marshallian scissors, and the basic principles of monopoly, and the models of pure competition. The principles was used as a text at UCT right up until the 1950s. But let's look at why Marshall was a consolidator. <clears throat> I put this up on the board for you. And I think that it is of importance. Half, Marshall takes a very different approach to what we had seen previously. Marshall's inspirations were um, a little more of the natural world. something to help try and describe this. Half hidden under a change of thicket, thick biological metaphors derived from Darwin, Marshall's world is full of change and growth. It is a world where producers and merchants operate in a real world with real money, not in some sort of Walrasian environment where barter takes place and auctioneering occurs. To deal with this problem, he introduces the idea of the representative firm. And he says that the representative firm can be used to aggregate across and form the demand and supply curves that we are now familiar with. He also says 
he also removes this idea of Walrasian auctioneering and instead sets down this, this, this model of, uh, of the firm and says that it must make a normal profit. Marshall is cautious too. He speaks about how instead of competition, as in the Walrasian situation, uh, competition removing our peers, Marshall speaks about the forests and the natural selection of how this one representative firm simply represents a tree in the forest and how the falling and, and this falling of this tree goes on and on and maybe in the short run the, the tree is not successful, he makes the comparison, but in the long run the forest continues. Marshall is an output adjuster, while Volras is a price adjuster. And um, the process by which the Volrasian auctioneer happens uh, is called the tantamount process. So the auctioneer announces the price, and then as you know, people go around trying to inquire what exactly was um, the, the going rate, and how many people wanted that this good. You've covered this in advanced micro macro. Vol is called this tantamount, which is the French translation directly is groping. And it's actually quite a nice uh, idea of people trying to walk around, finding each other and discussing uh, the various prices at which uh, they are willing to make exchanges. All of this, though, I think is familiar with to you. And I must agree, is probably not the most exciting. So let's look at some things that maybe aren't. Volvus, Marshall came up with this. Marshall came up with the first uh, sort of time frame because we spoke, we've spoken about how he came up with a different time. And he defined the shortest period, the supply on hand, short period which can be produced at an available plant, and in the long run which we are already used to. <laughs> Do you see how much this is informing our modern? or our own experiences of economics, despite not being particularly interesting. Finally, I think it's important to have a little bit about what Marshall had to say on value. Uh, and then we're going to move on to something that's nice and fresh. The value of all commodities is determined by the equation of supply and demand. And this was a big contrast to what the classical economists had had. The classical economists had, con had assumed that the supply side, supply side had fixed costs, and that these fixed costs kind of scaled up as you went along. There is some price on which the average can be supplied. That's the idea of amalgamating the firm, and the amount actually sold, on average, is that for which the price at which well, it can be on average supplied is exactly equal to the price at which it... Oh dear, hold on. We have here the causes which determine prices expressed in terms of desires of individuals. And this links into his, to the, what you're already familiar with, the forming of the utility curve, um, the, using the utility curve to form the demand curve. Being able to put it on some of himself that accordingly, if we consider the average conditions of a period very long as compared with time required for the production of a commodity on a scale sufficiently large, the prices at which those sellers are only just willing to sell induced to do it as such to cover the cost of production that that portion of the commodity on which the supposition that we are given the amount is produced is at great expense. This is the summation of, his, of what his contribution is. It's using the representative firm. The summation is at greatest expense, is linked to how we only receive normal profits, etc. But here's the trick. What's nice about this is Marshall came up with something called the Cambridge Equation, which you wouldn't have yet seen. <coughs> and it forms from the following. But when we come to the theory of money, we are told that its value depends on the amount together with the rapidity of circulation. 
Do you know what we're referring to? We're going to, we're going to start building up the quantity theory of money. On the next slide, we'll see it in its full. Rapidity of circulation. And although in this account we should naturally be led to infer the presence of some regulating conditions, although on reading the exposition of the theory in Ezestel, it is given, for instance, in Mill, we find these conditions distinctly enunciated. We do not find we do not find a clear statement of balancing of averages. In the ultimate analysis, must be found to determine the magnitude of every quantity which rests upon the will of man. If we seek for this, we will find the rapidity of circulation. It is not the most convenient thing to be the basis of, of our investigation. Mill is very different, and you would have seen now from this reading, from reading Jevons. Jevons feels comparatively modern. But Mill, unfortunately, is style ended up in a bit of a time warp. And as such, I haven't said anything for primary reading because in part it's very familiar reading to you. But let's have a look at what... Did I keep saying Mill again? Sorry, Marshall. Let's have a look at what Marshall had to say and derived using the quantity theory of money. Now, this is the quantity theory of money. MV equals PT, right? This is a simple algebraic manipulation. Regard K as 1 over V as representing some ratio of desired cash to normal value. And then much follows. But what Marshall shows is that money demand is a function of the desired ratio of cash balances the output of final goods and services and price level. Now this might seem familiar to you now, but this was revolutionary at the time. Um, and it also links together the total production of a country and its money demand in a way that uh, is, had later inspired Keynes. And Keynes was Marshall's great pupil. Keynes studied under Marshall and he was the one who encouraged Marshall to publish vast chunks of his work. Enough of Marshall. It's not that exciting, is it? Kunt Wechsel, on the other hand, is an all-time favorite. I very carefully want to try and give you an impression of how interesting Kunt Wechsel is as an economist and as a person. Kunt Wechsel lived his entire life as a radical activist and as a socialist, and he wanted, always was, um, always was writing pamphlets. He loved a pamphlet, short little publications on things. Well, his life was kind of marred by these uh, successes of scandals. Um, the first one that started off his career as an economist was a pamphlet, a few words on the important cases of social misery and its remedies with reference to special, with special reference to drunkenness. Now, in this pamphlet, and it's quite amusing, he says that, um, very tactfully in fact, Drunkenness is associated with poverty. Is associated with poverty. Uh, he says that um, poverty is the cause of over overpopulation, and therefore he urges you to very kindly keep children down to one or two, nothing more. But being from or part of the Austrian Empire. Uh, this was considered an act of, of great outrage. Wechsel was announced a human monster for such a suggestion that uh, he would want to monitor, uh, monitor, limit the amount of children that we could have. And they were caused to prosecute. Thankfully, though, Wechsel managed to avoid these because uh, it became a continental-wide question 
which you might see in other, mix, other material, called the Vixel Quest. And this is historically the first time that matters with regards to birth control, population, were really considered in an economic and social perspective out in the open in broad-based newspaper publications. But Vixel hadn't yet actually managed to um, grasp the notion of economics. He went, had to go outside Sweden after this publication, uh, in part because of the political pressures that arose from it. And he studied under a vast array of continental, as well as British school people. Jevons, Edgeworth, Volras and Menger were all his teachers. But he eventually settled down and received a large part of his education outside of his native Sweden, under Menger. Now, it is as bad as it sounds. Vixel was the consolidator of the British schools of marginalist thought, but this time, unlike Marshall, coming from an Austrian perspective. The thing that made Vixel so excellent is that the arguments of the Austrian school are remembered through Vixel. He was also, like Marshall, drawn and inspired to economics through problems that arose through his own personal life. He experienced a religious crisis, and this drove him to want to be concerned with issues relating to, um, to the economy. At age 43, Vixel wanted submitted his PhD in economics. Now, it seems a little late to want to submit a PhD. And especially considering he was being examined by people younger than him and the scandal that this man had followed, he was denied access to uh, a professorship at the University of New South Wales. And instead, the only way he could get his universityship was to undertake a degree in law, because the law department of that university were willing to take him on. And this was one of the first sort of testimonies to this. He completed a four-year degree in law while supporting his own children, an avid journalist who was earning his income through journalism at that time, and um, passed in the first division. This is a 43-year-old man with children to look after. Another scandal quickly preceded him. Vixel was to be elected to the, uh, to the chair of um, the norm, to, to, to the chair of the English word. The chair at Lund. And Lund is a very famous Swiss city in Sweden, and uh, it has to do more with the sort of financial management of it. Um, Vixel, although being an avid social reformer, refused to sign his letter uh, humbly, Kunt Vixel, and instead, adamant that he was going to cause another scandal, signed it respectfully. Well, the king, who oversaw every appointment uh, in Sweden at that time of university professors and economic people, was moderately offended, but Vixel got the job anyway, as opposed to his great competitor, Cassell. And the reason he was given it was because he had a law degree. But perhaps this is the beginning of the end. For the next pamphlet, and this pamphlet's title is delightful, The Throne, the Altar, the Sword and the Money Bags was about the separation of Sweden and Norway, which at this time had not yet happened. The involvement of the church uh, in this pamphlet brought Vixel into such conviction that he was sent to prison. And now his, his life as a, um, as a great economist began. At age 58, he served out his jail sentence, continuing his academic and journalistic career in the cell of Gustav prison. 
Many literary and scientific masterpieces have been written in prison. Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, Bertrand Russell's book on the philosophy of mathematics. But this is the only example of a A-class work of economics produced in prison. And what did the lectures have to say with about it? He marries the Rayesian theory to von Warwick's capital theory. This is the first great contribution. He does so by exploiting this idea of roundaboutness, which we discussed, and the way that there is this waiting between periods. He says that there is a marginal property that we can achieve out of this waiting. And von, von Warwick's theory of capital is really now understood through Wixel. He also makes for a fantastic review of capital and states how we can show mathematically, and this holds still today, that if bank rates differ from the natural rate of interest, we get a divergence which will never allow us back into equilibrium. The amount of Vixel that is available uh, is vast. But Today, I think, we should remember him for what is often now considered the most overlooked part of his contribution to economics. And this is the Vixel effect. Now, the Vixel effect is something that you might not necessarily, well, you won't know, but if we put a production function, a very typical Cobb-Douglas production function, right? We saw, according to Wicksteed, how we could break up this production function into its marginal parts, right? And we saw the Wicksteed proposition told us, told us that in fact, according to this theory, every part the labor or the, the capital should earn its marginal due. Now, this is a tricky argument because it, it essentially says, and it was recovered by Weiser with these, these uh, non-constant stuff, this is a short recap, that no exploitation can take place. But it's essentially an effect of what we are now about to see. The Vixel effect says that there is a switching. Between capital intensities in a production function. Whoa, what does this mean? Well, it means that now, you need to think about this a little more aggregated than... Remember, all economic theory pretty much holds on a micro level. You know, if we're thinking about a production function of just uh, me and the three other people, that would hold. But when you're talking to talk about productions of firms, which Vixel was very concerned about, you'll see the following. this tidily and, and, and gently because it's the takeaway from my five lectures. So we should get it right. We have process one. And we have process two. Now suppose Alright, 
let's, let's just make sure we know what's going on. This is a graph not of the production function, all right? It's a progra graph of profit, which we could derive from something like this with a little bit of manipulation. You know, we know that this is equal to output. And then we've got to just subtract costs, okay? It's a graph of profit against a single element of our production function. This could have been wages, capital, etc. So we we're investigating this idea of output indirectly through profit. Same, you know, we could we could uh, as equally say something. Yeah. The, suppose the entrepreneur needs to choose between two techniques employing both capital and labor. Now, we have process one and process two, and they both employ capital and labor, as the production function shows. The wage is externally given, right? So when the wage is less than W1, we see that process one, this is a process of combining capital and labor lies above process two. The process one is more profitable than the process two, right? But as we move a little on, things start changing. As the wage rises, because this is wage zero, as the wage rises, it's exogenous, remember, so it can rise independent of us. The, there is a desire to want to switch from one process to another. So, what could you say about this? You could say that you could substitute We could substitute a capital intensive process for a labor intensive process. Yeah? We could substitute the wage goes up, we could substitute a capital intensive process for a labor so order. Four, yeah. So here's the capital process. We need to consider this as being uh, more labor. This is more capital. We could substitute the two. But as the wage continues to rise, we end up in a situation we the nature of this very combination means that we have a re-switching, a switching back to process two. And process two, once more, becomes the more profitable process. So are we now say are we now to say that capital that technique one is in fact more capital intensive. Does that make sense? Are we now to say that process one, one more capital intensive? Well, the answer is no. This re-switching problem occurs a lot 
the graphs of re-switching between two different processes, between, you could call them two different production functions, occurs much more than one realizes. And we're going to see, when we work on next week, next week's lecture, how this Vixel process links into the Cambridge Capital Controls. Does anyone want to wager a sort of guess at why this is significant? And why is this the critique that I want to try and carry through? Can anyone perhaps see at this stage, although I would agree it's maybe early, um, where this could head to? Yeah? Pass point W to a pass wage to, it becomes profitable, becomes more profitable to two wages, which is against the theory of the more expensive a factor becomes a less Absolutely, but uh, that's a good point. But what is this, what is, the, what underlines, what is dependent on theory of production? Economic knowledge, right? That is dependent on production functions. Do you disagree with me? Anyone? Big bum? What is dependent on, in our economic theory, on things that would un use production functions. When have you used production functions before? In your own experience as a student, what do you use production functions for? That's it. There we go. It's a maximization problem. We use production functions to try and balance this idea of labor to capital. We use this in a marginal setting. And yet, there is an inherent problem with using production functions in this sort of setting. The problem arises because of a re-switching problem, that we actually experience a situation where one production function would be completely chosen away from into another production function. And we have switching between the two. And yet we're trying to draw marginal analyses on things which are not, you know, we're considering them um, to be constant. The Cambridge capital controversy will feed into this. And you'll see how this has massive implications for economics, both micro and macro. There's two minutes left of this lecture. And I think that it's important to mention the one other very important contribution of Vixel. Vixel's contributions to money cannot be overlooked. His lectures, volume two, is a book on money and banking. And it's a really fantastic piece of work. It's not something which I can unfortunately show you much of because it requires too much background. The Vixel process is a great example of something that I can still show you. But the mathematics that undermine these, this basic graph um, is a little bit, it's been simplified to make it presentable in half a lecture. To give you a little bit more of an idea, most re-switching processes when comparing two processes look more like this. These constant re-switching. Next week when we do the Robinson problem, we're going to be looking at a reading from an a hist his economic historian, Blau, who talks on the, this, this massive problem of re-switching and switching. And you'll certainly see that it will probably be one of the more depressing parts of your economic experience. Anyway, I leave you with two last little thoughts on Vixen. Vixel got the opportunity to meet John Maynard Keynes. And this was in a period before Keynes was uh, yet risen to his now very high esteem. There is a big, big difference between South African and continental thought in this regard. In other parts of the world, Vixel has informed economics a lot more. Samuelson, um, uh, 
and Milton Friedman both acknowledged their debt to Vixel. And Vixel's principles of money go on to form more of the American background. But this is a little anecdote of how modest and simple Vixel was as a person. He says, Then today I met Keynes and lunched with him at his head club. We had a very interesting conversation. On some points, Keynes was not very well informed. For one thing, he had no clear idea of how to go about arranging a rational standard of value. This is unlike, we spoke about how he had married the value standard. <clears throat> Though, the, yeah, okay, thought it would be relatively easy, for instance, on the lines of Ivan Fisher. Now, the lines of Ivan Fisher derived the Cambridge uh, equation that we saw earlier, and this is a value equation for trying to goods and money. He was very surprised when I began to criticize Fisher, but admitted straight away that all my objections were valid. On the other hand, he has a good mind, Keynes. As I said, I gained much from our conversation, only I wished it had been longer. But he had to go as soon as we'd finished lunch. However, I did get the opportunity to walk him to his barber. So that's, so that's kind of the reconciliation era. And there's a great pity that Keynes never actually got to read Wexel's work and never knew who this funny economist was. And he writes on it in his, own, in his autobiography that he met this funny Austrian guy. And he knew a lot about everything, but he didn't know why. Because he never managed to read Wexel until 10 years after his general thesis. Um, you're welcome to leave, but I'll just keep screaming in front of you. Vixel died a year ago. In Austria, he, after all of these controversies, was lauded by the Labour Party, the Labour Division of Austria. He was seen as a hero and should be, and should be more fondly remembered as one of the greatest contributors to economics. If only just for the Vixel problem. Thank you.